Welcome everyone to Tales of the LGBTQ+. My name is Douglas Parsons. Quinn Wade is an enigma. He will tell you that. He will also use other words to describe him as well, but I believe enigma is the best word for now. In researching his life story, I was able to, to discover a lot of different things. And yet, I didn't know who he was. Today's episode really delves deep into who he is, and he has been very forthcoming in sharing his story. It's a story where he was confined mostly to a wheelchair for over 20 years. Today, you would see him walking, dancing, twerking. How did that come to be? We talk about the love good boxes, which he is a part of. These boxes have been popping up around Edmonton, Alberta for the last couple of years. These boxes go to feed the hungry within the city. What happened? How did this start? And there's a fantastic story about some golden girls who have helped out. But even with all of my research, there was an integral part about him that I was never able to find out about. He trusts you, the listener, and I'm honored that he trusts me to be able to ask these questions and for him to share to the world. I'm, I'm completely honored and dumbfounded at times, but we're here to tell the tales. We're here to tell the stories. The first 20 minutes of this interview is extremely important because it shines a light on an aspect of our rainbow community that we don't talk a lot about. We don't know a lot about, but thanks to Quinn, we get a way to start. So here today on Tales of the LGBTQ+, we are going to chat with Quinn Wade, the Enigma. Tales of the LGBTQ+, starts right now. Welcome to this episode of Tales of the LGBTQ+. How's it going, Quinn? Good, good. We have a whole bunch of sunshine, uh, not a lot of snow. This is a good thing. No minus 40. Absolutely. I might put away my jacket, but not quite yet. You, There's that extra snowfall that always shows up. So Yeah, it's, it's beginning to be barbecue season, but it's not specifically shortened t-shirt season yet. Exactly. Well, I'm really interested in this conversation because for the little bit I've been able to research and find out about you, color me intrigued. There's some things that you've gone through in life that I definitely want to know more about. So just to begin everything, what would you say as just a general way of introducing yourself to everybody? Usually I just use my name. <laughs> this is kind of how it is. I just say Quinn Wade. Um, if I'm in drag, it's Harry Schnitzel. Um, I'm not really picky about my pronouns. I don't use they, but that's just a personal choice. Like I don't have a problem with anybody who does. It's just not my choice. But, you know, flipping the pronouns between he and she is not such a big deal for me because, well, drag. <laughs> you know? And I'm intersex, so... You know, so it really is kind of irrelevant that way, so. Okay, well, let's touch upon that. Uh, for a few people who are listening to us today, they may not totally understand what the word intersex means. What is the definition for that? Or at least what does that mean to you? Um, I was actually born with both sexes, like physically both sexes. So, but I have, you know, working parts, <laughs> you know, working male parts. I have less female parts than male parts. But chromosomally, I'm actually both sexes and right down, right down the middle. So, you know, so, and I was raised, my parents, I was a twin and my parents uh, raised my brother as my brother until, well, until we were five because my brother actually died then. But, um, and then they raised me as female. So it's always been kind of a weird kind of, 
I felt like I was in drag no matter what I was doing from day one, right? Like I came out in drag because that's how it was. And back then, they usually changed you to one sex or another because this is like 1971, right? And they didn't even tell the parents. Somehow we escaped that. And so I was never changed. And I never made a dis like, I guess I made a decision not to change. It was because it's who I am. I would be missing one part of me if that were the case. And at what age did you find out about this intersex part of you? Was it during puberty or? Well, I knew when I was young. Yeah, I knew when I was young because things didn't look the same. You know, like <laughs> other guys didn't look the same. Clearly other girls didn't look the same. Like I was talking at a really young age because my parents were, you know, they put you in dresses and my mother would just say, you know, put that away. It looks like you have a heart on. But it was almost like she was joking as a girl, but it was true. And she knew that. And it was just like, because they wouldn't really, they weren't going to go there. They weren't going to acknowledge it. But I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I really came to it when I was, you know, um, well, obviously puberty was a huge issue, you know, and then they didn't put me on hormones or anything because nobody was going to, I was small town of and nobody was going to admit this, right? So, you know, later on when I got older and in, out of the house and basically escaped right deer, <laughs> you know, and you know, went to university and then, then I had genetic testing done because, you know, I just was like, no, this is ridiculous. Like I'm tired of going to the doctor and having all the questions and, you know, and I was on the rowing crew. And so we had to have all these tests anyway. So when they did them, I just said, you know, if you're going to do a chromosome test anyway, you might as well test for this. Yeah. And so when you receive, when you received the chromosome results, did it cause more confusion or was it a relief to you at that point to kind of go, <sighs> this is what it is. I wasn't surprised, obviously, because I mean, you know, physically I knew anyway. And I was, in a way, it was kind of like, yeah, okay, you know what, I know what this is. But then I was mad because my parents, and it took a long time for me to come to sort of, I don't want to say forgiving them because I don't think it's ever up to us to forgive. Like that's when you go on elsewhere, then that's somebody else's job, right? <laughs> but you know, once you make the journey, that's their job, not yours to forgive. But I had a hard time understanding why my parents would do that, um, would make a decision for me, but then not have me changed at birth. That didn't make any sense. So, uh, you know, and I'm glad they didn't, but so it was kind of a relief, but it kind of was, um, it was kind of also very hard for me to understand and then not be angry because I was angry for a long time with my family over that. Because what do you do, right? You're like, well, wait a minute. I identify as a boy because I have the parts of a boy, but I was forced to talk and I was forced to do all this stuff and forced into this gender that I wasn't. And, you know, I wonder if my brother had lived, if he would have been the other way and felt forced into being a male. I don't know because we were identical twins, right? Oops. So, yeah. So there was a lot of anger there. Absolutely. I can understand that. On the flip side, too, I can also maybe understand coming from your parents' viewpoint a bit, too, because as you were mentioning, 1971, support groups, advice, doctors, they would be trying to figure it out on their own as well. It just a hard situation for everyone. I, I just can't imagine. Well, there were a lot of backroom discussions at, at doctor's offices. And then, you know, later on when I got older, of course, you're going to go off to, you know, you have to have certain things checked out. Like you have to go to urology, you have to go to gynecology. And I would just get harassed or, you know, called various names that I won't go into for obvious trigger reasons for people and stuff. But, you know, the, I would be called names. I would be harassed. Sometimes it would just be, you know, they kicked me right out of the doctor's office because they didn't know what to do with me. And now it's a whole nother matter. Like, I mean, I, that still happens, but to me, it hasn't happened now, but there's still kind of, there's still a, you know, a thing of, oh, we think you're going through menopause. And I'm like, well, we don't know what that means for me because, you know, different hormones are going to be different places, right? And so they don't know what that means. So then I get into the doctor's office and, you know, you're there with your sheet on and they're deciding they're going to check things out and things don't, 
you know, go in places that they should go if you're a woman to check those out for me because that's all closed off. And then they're, so they bring in a male doctor and then there's a backdoor discussion about what they're going to do about this. And then they'll decide whether they're going to send me to urology or to gynecology or who should deal with this. Like I still go through that, right? Is there a support group or have you met people who are, have been in the same situation as you that you can talk about these uh, medical questions and get information from? Is that type of support available here in Alberta, Canada, worldwide? It is in Toronto and it has been for a long time in Toronto. I actually did meet a friend of mine way back in the BBS days where, you know, we were both intersexed, you know, and so we understood each other a lot differently. We became really good friends and, you know, um, but I haven't seen that here in Alberta um, very often intersex people get kind of lumped in under the, under the inclusivity under trans and we're not trans you know we're not we're we're a whole separate entity of that i don't have the experience a trans person has of transition i will never know what it's like to take hormones or to have the surgery or to be recovering from the surgery or to you know but yet there are also similar experiences you know like there is the misgendering there is the you know, the back and forth, the, the, the things about whether you, if you identify as male, whether, you know, there's still that harassment for intersex people that there is for trans people, but, and some of the same life experiences, like being forced into a gender that you don't identify with, but identifying as both for me is a whole different experience than somebody who is born into a body that isn't where they are. So, you know, so that's where, you can get some support from the trans community, but largely we're ignored. Like we just, it's just like, you know, oh, well that's, or, or assumed to be asexual, which is not true either. Like parts work, you know, or, you know, you look at dating and you have to find a very progressive person that, you know, because some, especially gay men, you know, I hate to say it, but especially gay men, they want a real man fairly often and, or they want, a transsexual because then you're like a performance thing for them or an experience that they've tried or something and it just doesn't work so you know and that's not to say all people are like that because they're not right like there's some really good people out there and and but i've had those experiences and so that becomes an issue you know it really does yeah and just for Posterity's sake and all that. I just want to make sure that when you said real men, that the air quotes were put in there as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, just just in case someone heard that as well. Well, yeah, that's kind of what I mean. Is like they're just like quoting. You know, they're saying, "Well, we want a real man." You know, and it's like, "Well, what am I? I'm still a man." You know, I'm still male as far as I'm concerned, and so, you know, how does that make me a real man? And what makes a man? Like you have to, you have to ask that question, right? What is the measure of a man? Then is it all about what your dick looks like? Or is it all about, you know, whether you have both parts? Or is it all attitude? What is it, right? So th there's that whole question, but it makes people question too, which is a good thing. Yeah, it's a very important question to have. One that we start to have at many times and then we shy away because we're worried about what our own judgment would be with that or perhaps we have a bias or something that comes from that, that we, we fear our own answers when it comes to that. As an ally, as someone who wants to be supportive uh, to you and the journey that you are on, how can someone be supportive? How does, what does that look like? Or how can we show support as you're on this journey? Well, I would say, you know, intersex people shouldn't be put in and and that's that's respect for the trans community as well intersex people should not be lumped in to the trans community if you say you're intersex and, and there are intersex people in alberta i know that there are some in edmonton that i know of you know and but if you lump us into that trans and say oh well you know it's the same thing it's not the same thing and that's something that needs to be understood is this is my experience as an intersex person is not the experience of a trans person. So I can't speak on behalf. I've had that happen. People have asked me to speak on behalf of the trans community. I cannot, and I won't, 
It's not my place. But it is also not the place of the trans community to speak on behalf of intersex people either. Is there a good resource that uh, could help people understand more other than trying to get a hold of you on Facebook and ask you a million questions? But is there a good res resource that has been created for this where we can l begin to learn and to do better? I think it's sort of starting a little bit, but I haven't seen a whole lot out there. I mean, because we're largely invisible in the community is, you know, and we're seen as a rarity, which we're actually not. You know, there's there's a lot. I think it's one in 5,000 now are born intersex of some form or another. And people are not changing like we used to change. Like we're not being changed into one sex or the other anymore the same way. So we're going to see more of those as kids get older and they age, right? And well, I don't mean age, but you know, as they get older and they grow up, we're going to start seeing more people who actually are intersex. And then with non people identifying as non-binary now, we're also going to see some more support up that way, you know, just because of that, that identification. But right now, not a whole lot. Here's another question for you and, and being completely honest on my part, um, coming into this conversation, we've never met in real life and only have had a few conversations through Facebook. Uh, however, I did I have seen you many times before, especially when you were playing your saxophone. And I've always wondered, you know, I, I didn't know, but, um, but of course I would never come to you and ask you those type of questions or those, you know, I just wouldn't be right. I don't know if I've got a, a, a perfect question here is, but I would imagine that you've had people approach you in the past and have been very blunt and have come to you. Is that the proper way to just come up and ask you? Or, it, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, one wants to have a conversation to learn, but I wouldn't want you to be the end all be all to have to deal with this time after time after time. And yet it's fascinating. Well, it kind of depends. Like in, if I'm in the middle of a busking song coming up and asking me what the hell gender I am is like an issue, right? Like, <laughs> put your five bucks in and go on your merry way and ask some other time. I mean, I also am not picky about asking. Like it, some people may be offended by that. You know, I'm not just because it's like, well, you know what? there may be other people out there then and if somebody asks a question however bluntly it is it is usually just because they don't know and they want to know if it's rude if they start asking rudely you know like we go through that in our community anyway or, or you know that it's going to be uh i i would say a homophobic comment but really an intersex phobic comment <laughs> i don't know how else to explain it or they just assume you're gay and you're going to be homophobic of course i'm not going to respond to that you know um I had it happen when I was busking in Halifax one day and I was just fed up with it because we'd get these tourists off the cruise ships, hey, and I'd be out there busking for them and they came up with five bucks and they leaned way in and said, I just have a question. And I'm thinking, okay, it's a question about what song was that or whatever. Are you a boy or a girl? And I've had this all my life, right? And I just had it. And so I just looked at them and said, I'm a transsexual, bisexual, intersexed hermaphrodite. Because at that point we were just, that's what they called us, right? And this person screamed, dropped the five, and ran down to the ferry terminal. And I was killing myself laughing. As, as phobic as that was, it was funny because it also wasn't totally untrue, right? But I was just fed up and I was like, no, I'm just going to tell them then. You know, and I've been really open about that ever since. You know, I'll just say like, hey, look. But then I also get on the other side. Well, I'm almost kind of like, I'm doing the quotes again, just so you know. I'm also kind of like an exception to people who are going to be transphobic because I was born this way. So that's okay. And that's not right. And I will challenge that 15 ways from Sunday. You know, because I was born this way, but so was somebody who is transsexual. They were born that way. You know, and so it's like for them to say, well, you're an exception, make a hierarchy. And I get that in both the straight community and the gay community. I'm like, I'm not an exception. 
just because, well, you didn't have a choice. And I'm like, well, you know what? I did have a choice. I could have decided to have surgery and change to one or the other. I could have decided to have all my female parts removed. I didn't. So I did have a choice, you know, and, but I didn't have a choice either because it would have, you know, like I said before, it would have negated that other part of me and I would have missed it and wondered my whole life. So now I don't wonder. Yeah. Something that you said earlier, I want to touch upon again, that, you know, basically your entire life, you felt like you've been in drag and it's, you know, come out drag and, uh, and it's very interesting because you mentioned your drag name as being Harry Schnitzel, which is quite clever, you know, especially when we take a look at the drag names itself. How has uh, been a, how has being a performer helped you in this journey that you are on? Well, it's kind of funny because way before Harry Schnitzel existed, I had a radio show in Ottawa as Miss Magnolia, but I wasn't, I wasn't visible because it was a radio show. Um, but I had her set up and, you know, later on I did drag as Miss Magnolia, but, um, I had her basically set up to be everything my parents expected to be, but I wasn't. So she was this, you know, but I made her into kind of a mix between Miss Piggy, Blanche Devereaux and, uh, Dame Edna at that point, but before we really got into how transphobic Dame Edna could be, let's not have that debate right now. Cause this is way back then. Right. And, but it was like, she was outlandish and she was, you know, confident, but instead of, but she was, she won every crown kind of thing in her own mind but only in her own mind because she virtually won it, which meant she watched American Idol on television and determined herself the winner. She was usually drunk. You know, I had her set up as a character that came from Hamhock, Georgia in a trailer park, but thought she was, you know, the whole, the whole thing about, you know, the, the Southern debutante thing. And, you know, um, I visited Tennessee, uh, and actually that's where Harry Schnitzel came out of because my friend in Tennessee and I were, we've been friends for years and years and years. And we started chatting about it. And I, I phoned her up one day and said, I need a drag name because I'm going to do boy drag, you know? And she says, Oh, you have to do Harry Schnitzel, honey, you have to do Harry Schnitzel. Right. And it got so funny. And we, I just roared and she said, I'm telling you, hair schnitzel <laughs> and so that's what you know i can't credit myself with that one because i didn't come up with that name um but for me it was it was funny because it wasn't like i could be myself so it's almost like with miss magnolia it was a character but it was a character to get that out of me that that sort of um that sort of comedic part of what my parents expected me to be because you know my parents were rich they were well off well they were rich let's face it they were very rich and i was very privileged as a child but i wasn't also because i was having to hide in this persona which is what miss magnolia does but on a class level you know so it became i just kind of had to change it around a little bit but also that sort of hiding because miss magnolia is a, a drag queen at the same time you know, but she has, you know, her dress, she calls her hairdresser uh, Raul, but really he's Ralph and lives in the next trailer, you know, but this kind of idea, right? So that's how I got that. Harry became more of less of a character, I guess, like quotes again, uh, less of a character for me, less of a parody, but also somewhat of a parody too, you know, Harry is more me, really. But Harry is that performer that, you know, will go out and, and do the comedy act, but also turn around and do Broadway or do something else. And it's things that I always had wanted to do and couldn't, you know, because I couldn't be a boy, you know, back then. So now it's like, you know, it just became, he's not a character, but he can do the things that, like, I couldn't have ever done a Broadway performance as a boy when I was young. There'd be no way, you know, I wouldn't have been out busking in my boy self because there was no way you could do it. So when you were busking, were you Quinn or were you Harry Schnitzel? Quinn. 
clean. Yeah, because that wasn't a drag thing for me. That that was that's a lifelong passion, and that's how I got through a lot of the hell that was my childhood. Right? I just went to music and drove my parents absolutely insane. You know, it was a saxophone. I'd play in the basement for four hours, and my mother would come down and go, "Do you think?" Maybe? Well, I played my room for four hours, and she'd go. Do you think maybe you can move that to the basement? At which point I went and there'd be four more hours of playing and she'd go, do you think it's time to stop? And I get the space here and be out in the garage and, you know, annoy the neighborhood. So that's always been a passion for me. So that's a me thing. That's a Quinn thing. That's who I am, right? It's part of who I am. Well, it's not a full identity because I'm so many different and we all are, right? We all have more than one thing. It's, but it's, you know, I always say I'm going to marry my saxophone because really, you know, we have arguments. We've been through it all. You know, we've been ill together. She's been ill or he's been ill and I've been ill and I just made, and then, you know, and then we both been on, had these really good days, you know. So it's like, and we live together mostly harmoniously, except when one of us needs repair, you know, <laughs> so yeah, so I've always said it, but I put my sacks away for four years uh, to do my degree because I was kind of another forced kind of thing. I was forced to do something that wasn't music because music was never going to get me anywhere, you know, according to my family. And how old were you when you put the saxophone away then? Uh, 19? 19, 19 to 23. And I shoved it under my bed. You know, I took it with me, but I shoved it under my bed because I couldn't look at it. Because I knew it would call me back and I knew I'd just be done and that would be it, right? So obviously after four years, it did call you back. What saxophone beat, what saxophone beat was played to bring you back into each other's lives? Well, I was really depressed back then. And quite frankly, I was into a lot of vodka. Um, <laughs> and I mean... I wasn't an alcoholic, but I was starting to border on one, and even I knew it. And my mother was an alcoholic, so I knew the signs. And, you know, I was sitting in my room with a hangover one day, and I went, you know what, I'm just going to take my, and I wasn't going to classes because I was depressed, right? I thought, I'm just going to take my sax out just once and see if I can still do it. And, of course, I was in a house with a bunch of roommates and that. So I didn't want to be, if I was really bad, I didn't want to be, you know, pulling on what I did with my parents. So I took it out uh, beside the Rideau Canal and opened, and I just started playing. And all of a sudden somebody put 10 bucks in and said, yeah, this is how it's done. And I was sitting there going, oh, this is a secondary job for me while I'm going through. You know, I can quit my fast food job kind of thing and that's that's just, that's how it really started yeah well and that's how i got to see you for the first time from afar now well, i want to bridge into that because people who are going to be listening to this conversation today are going to obviously be fascinated by everything that you've said so far with being intersex when i first saw you you were in a wheelchair playing saxophone at various functions around the city busking. A few years ago, I saw you again, and you were standing upright. Of course, not knowing you, I'm like, what's going on here? So can you bring us back to everything that happened bef before? You, I had always assumed that you were part with the wheelchair for your entire life. But from what I understand, that's not the case. No, I actually, I had a brain virus, uh, 25 years. Well, I guess now it would be probably 30 years because uh, ago that, um, and actually it's caused some other problems now, but, um, I had a brain virus that, that they told me was fatal, but you know, I'm one of those people that just goes, screw it, you know, <laughs> oh, is it fatal? And I have my depression and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, so let's just live life anyway, because, it, you know, if you're going to die, you're going to die, right? So why bother moping around about it? And, you know, I do, and I did, but then I had a really good friend when that happened and he just, he 
took me, and I was in Halifax when this occurred, and he came into my house, and I was lying on the couch moping, <laughs> you know, and because I just, it, what it did is it took the, I could move my legs, but it took the nerves, like the nerve wasn't connecting them right. So for me to stand up, it would, I could stand sort of, but it would, like my leg would just kick out whenever it felt like it or do whatever it felt like doing. And um, so, and it particularly for whatever reason affected my legs and that didn't go away and they didn't expect it to. Um, neither did I, you know, I came to a point of acceptance where I was just like, okay, this is how it is. Like, so, you know, I look really buff. I do not look buff now in the yeah. <laughs> Like I was really buff. I saw a picture when I was sending stuff to you the other day. I was like, holy mackerel. Like I had some guns, man. But, um, which have since disappeared. Like, you know, flabs. Um, anyway, uh, but, yeah, but um, then it was, I mean, it was, he picked me up and he said, I'm giving you a week. You get a week to mourn yourself. You can do that. You know, have your feelings, do your thing. You're getting a week. I'm coming back in a week. And of course, you know, you're busy moping around a week later. And, you know, you're lying on the couch going, yeah, right. Okay. Like, you know, like he's going to come back. And if he comes back, oh, yeah, am I going to even go? I don't think so. Like, am I going to let him get to me? No, I'm too depressed, you know. I'm not getting off this couch ever again. You know, this kind of thing. Oh, no, he came up. And the first thing he did was take my wheelchair. He took it away. So I couldn't possibly get off the couch and put it in his van. And then he took me and put me in the van. <laughs> so I didn't get a choice. And he says, okay, it's time we're going out. And so I'm bitching all the way in the van, right? <laughs> complaining and carrying on the whole, and I don't even know where we're going. We ended up in his house in Sonyaville, uh, Nova Scotia. And all of a sudden, he says, okay, so pee and eat and do whatever it is you need to do. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, trust me. And I'm like, I already don't. <laughs> you know, like, you're and he goes, I'm taking your wheelchair and you again, the same way that I did if you don't suck it up and just pee and eat, do whatever, because this is the rest stop. And I'm like, oh, no. Next thing you know, he has me on a boat lobster fishing. So I, we're hauling up traps and I'm like, wow. And I remember him looking at me and saying, anything you can do in a wheelchair, you in, oh, sorry, anything you can do on feet, you can do in a wheelchair. So learn it because the world is not going to adapt to you. You have to learn to adapt to it. So learn, you know, and then we went blueberry picking, you know, and he had me up on the hill blueberry picking and he's like, and he stood at the bottom and said, okay, figure out how to get yourself down. I'll be here, but, you know, and then we went on this, we, we, I, and we were both in the AIDS movement at that point, so we were on this sort of conference circuit thing, that, you know, and we're at some AIDS conference in Montreal, and all our friends are there, and there's one of those glass elevators, and it happened to stop, and there's a whole bunch of people going to whatever dinner or whatever, and we're at the pool. He throws me in! <laughs> you know, it got funnier and funnier and then we we're on the metro down there and he goes okay you have to learn because there's no elevator he said so get down the stairs you know so he just took my chair down the stairs and off i went and the next time we had to go up the stairs at the other end oh and then he just like pushed me on the thing. he's like wee and i'm like oh my god i'm going all over montreal by myself and he hops on at the last minute you know this kind of thing but that changed my mind that's what really made me so adaptable to things because it was like it was him he's the one who just basically said you know it's it's not that you don't can't have feelings it's not that you can't do that kind of you know that kind of grieving it needs to be done for your own mental health but then there has to come a point where you do realize that the world isn't going to hand it to you on a silver platter because you're disabled or because you're intersexed or because you're gay. They're not going to, or because you're non-binary or trans or any other thing that goes on in your life or that you are. The world isn't, doesn't owe you anything and they're not going to. So you get to adapt to it. Doesn't mean you should fight, should not fight for your rights, but don't expect the world to adapt to you, right? You have to adapt to it in some way because it is what it is. Like I'm Métis and learned that too. Right. So that's all of that 
So I just learned all these things and it was just like, you know, then I'm snow shoveling and I'm doing all this other stuff, right? And then he's like, yeah, get out there and busk. You're, you're good now, yeah. you know? So when you're, yeah. so when you're out there busking, and you and you as you mentioned the relationship with the saxophone how how did the saxophone then play a part with your mental health and with your ability to overcome and to fight the good fight oh it saved me it it saved me when i was a youth you know i mean and i will always say that every youth if they get the opportunity to play an instrument or join especially a band like i know in alberta they're trying to cut all that stuff out you know and i'm a huge advocate of don't ever cut out music because for kids who are not jocks and i'm four foot ten and was even shorter then like i tried out for basketball every year never made it but i kept trying but you know i was and i was a, i was a jock in my own way but i was also a nerd so for me, it wasn't going to happen. I was good at things like soccer, but basketball, no, wasn't going to happen, right? Um, like stuff like that. And so for me, it was, okay, you know what? Music was the thing. I needed an outlet and music was a self-expression. And back then I was already in drag, but I didn't know I was in drag. And I'm in small town Alberta where being in drag was a very bad thing in the 80s. <laughs> very bad. Like, <laughs> you know, you had KKK and neo-Nazis wandering down in full, you know, full outfits of their own and pillowcases and, you know, everything else and red shoelaces and the whole nine yards going down Ross Street looking for somebody to meet up so you weren't going in drag. Yeah, and nobody was saying anything. No, no, oh no, you just accepted this as a norm. You'd see them at the drugstore, you know, buying Metamucil or something and it'd be like, oh my God, like, and we just accepted that. Like, it was just a normal thing for us then. And I mean, Red Deer has changed a lot because they're, you know, it still has its moments, but it's changed a lot since. Like back then, it was just nasty. And, but we accepted it as the norm because we grew up there. So you were either going to escape and go, and usually you did it by going to university or something. You found a way out or, you know, a way out that was sort of acceptable, right? But that whole thing with music, that's what got me through all of that. Like, you know, I was beat up more than once just because they sort of figured out that I was androgynous enough that that was good enough to beat, out, beat me up because I might be gay, you know, um, or, or just things like that. Like, you know, I had ribs broken. I had more broken bones in my body than enough, you know. And so when you learn that and you go, okay, you have to have an outlet somewhere to get all. And then there was all the stuff with my parents going on. I mean, they sure as hell weren't going to accept that I wasn't straight, let alone intersex. So you had all this expression and every kid has stuff in their life, maybe not that extreme, right? But there are things in their life that go on. I mean, puberty happens. That's hard enough in itself, you know? Yeah. And you have to find a way to express yourself. And for some kids, that's art. But it's always some form of art, like it's drag, or it's nowadays it's it's drag, or it's or it's visual arts, or it's video editing, or it's music. And for me, it was music. And it, I had a great music teacher, um, and then I had, I had the worst. I would say he's not the worst. Worst attitude was like he was just hard on me and berated me and berated me and berated me. And it took me a long time later to figure out. Oh, that was because he knew me and he knew I wasn't giving up. And the more he berated me, the better I got because I was going to work at it and I was going to prove him wrong. Right. And so there was that. And then music has done so much for my mental health though. Like it's, it's a thing that I can go out there in the grumpiest of moods and come back happy as a, as a clam because I've gotten it out somewhere, you know? Or, and maybe I'm depressed and maybe I'm happy that day or whatever, or maybe I'm grumpy, but I will go out and play something and I see a smile on somebody's face or some memory they remember, which is why I usually play older songs. You know, somebody goes down and they remember Bohemian Rhapsody or they remember In the Mood and then they're telling their grandchildren about it or, you know, um, that kind of thing. And so it always cheers me up when that happens. But I do find when, you know, when I'm busking and, 
and the rent is due and you're looking for the cash, I'm nowhere near as passionate because then you're in it for the money and that's a thing that I think is a problem, you know, for me. It's like that's when I'll just, I'll get what I need, sort of, and I'll go home. But it's, you know that if it hadn't been that way, I would be much happier, right? Because then I go home and I'm tired and I'm grumpy because I needed that extra 10 bucks or 20 bucks to make the rent or the food for the day or something. It's like, oh my God. Like, and you realize that it's not making you happy. So, you know, and having grown up rich, it doesn't never make me happy to have a whole lot of money, you know? And it was about that. It was about the expression. It was about the passion. It was about other people, really. It wasn't even about me. It was about putting that smile on somebody else. And I would pick out the person who looked the grumpiest going down the street. And I'd, get, and I'd see them half a block away. And in half a block, you had time. You know, you had time to, you had 30 seconds. You know, that's about what it takes for them to amble along, right? Grumping along. And you had, you had to figure out, wind speed, you had to figure out acoustics, and then you had to figure out that one song that was going to get to them. And I would get determined that if I made that one grumpy, really grumpy person smile, then my job was done. Then over the years, then you must have picked me out in a crowd and played me a couple of songs. <laughs> and if I got a tuny out of them, so much the better, you know, but... Even better. But that wasn't what it was about, you know. No, no, and, and rightfully so. Now, for these 25 years, then, had you given up hope of being able to have the feeling to be able to stand up? Like, were you working towards the goal to be able to stand and walk again? Or had you given up on that, that potential? I don't know if you could ever call it giving up. It was just more of an, a, an acceptance that, you know, if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, well, this is my life, so make the best of it, you know? It was like, do anyway, do exactly what my friend, who is now dearly departed, actually, um, that it's, you do that and you honor those people that, that came into your life and supported you by doing that, by just going, you know what, if I'm going to be in this wheelchair for the rest of my life, I'm going to do the best at it. And damn it, I'm going to be buff if it kills me. <laughs> you know? And, you know, so I worked on my arms more than I worked on my legs because I didn't know that my legs were going to end up fine. From what I was reading, there was a moment that things started happening. Can you tell our listeners about that, that moment? I went down to see a couple of friends in California. Um, and it's funny because we had been friends for years and it took me a very long time because they wouldn't let me fly because I had blood pressure issues and all kinds of things from left from that virus. And so, um, it took, and then, you know, just general finances and time and, you know, all that kind of thing. So we find, I finally went down there and I was climbing this. And I think, was this the first time or the second time I was down there in the same year, basically. Right. And I've been to California dozens and dozens of times, just not necessarily to see these friends. Right. And they had this rope ladder. And I think you probably have a picture of it. They had this sort of triangular rope ladder thing. And my friend is terrified of heights. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I seem to have, and I do better in California. Like I just did better there. And I think it was the sunshine and the air. And I was there, you know, all total that year, I was there five weeks, you know. And so I went to climb this rope ladder because, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was, you know, let's do this because it's fun and be. I'm buff now. <laughs> you know? So I'm, and I was feeling really good. So I'm climbing this ladder with my arms, like I always did. And she was filming it. And then she said, you know, your legs are moving, like not necessarily how they should be, you know, like I obviously wasn't just climbing. So no, you need to go back and have this looked at because your legs are moving. And that was the moment when I realized, I wonder how long they've been doing that. But then when you're in a chair here and you're not climbing things, you know, I mean, and, and the thing is, is, you know, you were talking earlier about, you know, you just assumed I'd been in it all my life. And that's not true of most people. Like, I mean, there are people that have been in, the, you know, that have been used a wheelchair all their life. Right. But for me, that's not true. For a number of people, that's not true. Some people use wheelchairs part time because they can't walk that far or there are knee issues or whatever. Like, 
someone in a wheelchair isn't necessarily always in that wheelchair. And that's something that's starting to come out now. So you came back to Edmonton, you got this checked out, and what did the doctor say? Were they shocked? Were they surprised? Nobody knew why. Well, at first they thought it was just involuntary movements, right? It was just kind of, okay, well, you've got these involuntary movements going on, and, you know, we don't really think it's much of anything. And then, um, but we'll we'll see what happens in the rehab. So then I was too healthy to keep doing rehab, so I got kicked out of there. Because <laughs> I was just... What does that mean, too healthy for rehab? Well, it, they were voluntary movements, right? And so... I didn't need that intense a rehab, right? And so then I'm over at OT because I still needed something, right? And I'm on those parallel bars and I could not get my, my legs would move, but they moved together. They wouldn't make the connection to go step over step over step over step. So I got the bright idea <laughs> lying in bed one night and my poor friend, Randy, <laughs> I got this bright idea in my head. Wait a minute. What makes you and forces you and what you never forget to do that over, over, over thing and become muscle memory again? Because all it is is connecting your brain again, right? I thought, God, it's riding a bike. You never forget how to ride a bike. So I phoned Randy. And Randy went with my hair brain idea, okay? <laughs> he really did. He phoned, I phoned him up and I said, Randy, I got to get a bike. And he didn't even question it. It was really funny because most people like would be like, oh my God, you're going to ride a bike and you're still like, you know, you're still mostly, like I wasn't totally in a wheelchair, but, you know, mostly I was doing the crutches thing by that point and because I couldn't get my legs to move more than together. So we get this bike and he says, and he thought I'd just be riding in the back, back alley or something and getting my, you know, figuring out what I was going to do and, you know, oh no, no. I had figured out how to get on the bike, on my crutches, and then take my crutches and strap them to my back. So I go flinging by his house, which is like the next neighborhood. And he's like, oh my God, what are you doing here? And then I couldn't get off the bike though. That was the, <laughs> the big issue was trying to get back off the bike. So I just kind of, not really fall over, but I kind of lean so I could get everything off myself. And then it just kept progressing from there. So then off I go to OT and I'm like, I didn't have a lock for my bike, so I had to wheel it in there. So I wheel in and I go, like, this is pre-COVID, right? So I wheel it in there and I'm like, and they're like, what are you doing? Well, this is my bike. And they're like, what? You should not be doing that. I'm like, screw you. I'm leaving now. Bye. I'm done. Clearly I'm fine. And I never really went back. Hey, I mean, I went, saw, you know, various things to deal with, you know, certain issues, but, you know, and then I was on a cane. Cane lasted about a week, you know, um, but I went, I think it's in the article. I went to Evo. And Evo being Evolution, a dance club here in Edmonton. Yeah, I went to Evo and I was still, like, I could get down the stairs on it because I'm still really wonky on stairs. I could get down the stairs on the cane, but then I was kind of in the wheelchair because, you know, I knew I couldn't stand that long. And so I stayed in the wheelchair for the show or whatever it was that was going on. And then at the end of the night, I stayed really late that night. At the end of the night, all of a sudden I get up and walk to this drag queen. <laughs> She's like, I think she dropped her gin. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know? I was just like, well, 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 you know. <laughs> like, it's a miracle. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I've been working. You know, and that's just, it just progressed from there. And then my feet hurt so much that, that first summer though, so much, you know. So now I got to ask, you know, as that concerned person, uh, you know, listening and of course I want to put everybody in bubble wrap all the time with, when these, in these situations, but is this going to be you from now on? Is this possible? Is this... Or have you been told there could be regression at all? Well, I mean, it's not so much regression. It caused a scar in my brain, which then caused a tumor, which then went moved into some cancerous stuff. You know, um, 
COVID has definitely, I had COVID and it has caused a whole bunch of complications with both of those things. So, I mean, that has been an issue. There are things that, you know, I, I, I don't want to say can't do because I never say never, you know, but there are things that I have to be really careful about, or I'm supposed to be being really careful about, let's face it. Uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> but, you know, there's also a part of me that says, you know, and, and I went through a real depression. I don't know whether it was COVID or I had a stroke after, like a minor stroke after COVID. And then, you know, with the, the tumor stuff that's going on too, there was also a huge issue there, you know, because it all just compounded each other. And I don't know which it was, because I know that all three of those can cause you, like, it's almost like a physical clinical depression. And I was really depressed till about October last year. And then all of a sudden, I just kind of picked up and went, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, like, I don't know what it was, whether the chemicals in my brain just suddenly kicked in or whatever, but I just kind of went, I'm not happy. And I don't like not being happy. And I'm not, you know, with myself. And I know part of it was I was lying on the couch, you know, like, and so I got up and started doing something, you know, but I mean, I think it was mostly that stroke and that was a post COVID stroke because my blood is really thick after having that. And then now I'm at risk for blood clots and all this other stuff. Right. So, um, and then I had a blood clot and then it caused, I mean, it wasn't a major stroke. Like it wasn't something that completely, but it reminded me that I can go there again. Yeah. And any of us can like, really, we can all go there at any time. Like I don't want to be the pessimist, but to be honest with you, you don't know when you're going to get a stroke. You don't know when you're going to have an accident and not use, be able to use your legs. You don't know if you're going to get a brain virus. You don't know if you're going to get brain cancer like I did or any other kind of cancer. Nobody knows that. Nobody can predict that stuff. So, you know. Well, let's let's continue on with this because you said October is when you kind of said, all right, you know, I got to kick myself out of this. You're part of a court uh, the, uh, the Imperial Sovereign Court of the Wild Rose, which is an Edmonton based or Northern Alberta based group, uh, that is drag queen, uh, as Empress Emperor. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this year's version of the Sovereign Court? Who are they and what are some of the things that you have been doing? I am actually a past prince uh, of theirs. I reigned uh, the year before. Um, so I'm Prince 44, Harry Schnitzel. <laughs> um, this year, uh, and, and the emperor and empress are carried away and Tanner Steele. Um, their upper house, uh, you have Princess Resi Re Resurrection and Prince Colin Bay. Um, and we have two duchesses or dutch <laughs> um, this year and usually there's a duke and a duchess but we have two chose they, they chose two dutch eye this year um and that is godiva who actually was a princess years ago um and, and legendary drag queen legendary yes that's the one yeah and um and bambi dextrous um yeah so they're raising money this year for the John M. Kerr Bursary Fund. That's their main for students. Um, and they've got a lot of shows coming up. Like, I know they, they just had one. Um, there's another, there's a Drag on Ice show coming up. There's, uh, I know there's a King show coming up that's benefiting that as well. Um, and they're doing a bottle drive. So save your bottles, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, uh, as far as I was in the show, actually, the other night. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. Well, and, and to go with this here as well, we're going to have an upcoming episode when we're going to be talk, uh, talking to our storytellers, our gay historians, uh, Ron Byers, Rob Borowski, who are going to give us the history of the Imperial uh, Court, uh, Sovereign Court of the Wild Rose. Uh, fascinating stories, uh, especially... Um, when it comes to how people are voted in and uh, some of the charities that they're involved with. There's something though that you've been doing this year and you've been, you were great about talking about some of these things, these shows and ball drives are coming up, 
but uh, you also kind of overlook something that I think is extremely important, and I know that you've got a part in this. In the city of Edmonton, you may notice that there are certain boxes around the city, uh, love good boxes, and you may notice that there's food inside these as well. Well, Harry Schnitzel, Quinn Wade, you are one of the architects of this. Please tell us more about these Love Good boxes. What they actually are is they work like a little library. And you people can walk by and donate food. Uh, Non-perishable, please. <laughs> no meat and stuff because, you know, AHS things, right? Um, and people who need that food can come and take it. And um, that it all started, actually, because I sprung out post-COVID <laughs> and mm -hmm. spotted this dirty box and it was you know and it had the door ripped off like it was a recycling bin from the city and I thought okay this is gross I'm gonna clean it because I was over in Paul Kane Park and I thought, I'm just gonna clean it up because at that point we couldn't you know we well we still can't but it's better than it was you couldn't gather but you could go for walks as long as you didn't go too far from your home and all this other stuff right so and I was stuck inside seven weeks because I had COVID. And so I had that extended period of time in and I was just, you know, happy as a clam to get out. And so I got out and I thought, I'm going to clean this box up. And then after I cleaned it all up, I went, why is something not being done with this? Like, what are you going to do with it? Now it's an empty box. It's just going to get dirty again. So I came home and phoned a couple of people and said, you know, I phoned, uh, actually Bianca Lovegood and, and some of the other Lovegood family and said, what can we do with this box? It's sitting there. So we tried an experiment. We put four packages of ramen noodles in that box and mm. went back by the end of the day to see if they were gone or, you know, somebody just wrecked things or whatever. No, the stupid thing took off. By the end of the day, that box was filled. People have started realizing And then we had this tourist groups. They would come by and people were taking pictures of it. And they, they just, you know, and then pretty soon, you know, it just started taking off more and more and more. And all of a sudden, you know, we're getting support. The community, it was really a lot of community support. Like, you know, yeah. I may have put four, four things of ramen noodles in, but in reality, the people and the, and the businesses, like, that put stuff in and members of the court as well you know because i've been past prince and at that point i was still reigning right so it, you know it was part of it it was almost like a legacy project of of that raid and so you know and there are court members who have put stuff in there are general members of the public who have put stuff in there are just all kinds of you know uh cobb's brand has put stuff in you know and then we partnered with chew so now we have a chew clothing box beside it and it just kept snowballing and just in a good way, right? So, And I should also just jump in. Uh, Chew uh, is the Chew Project. It's here in Edmonton, uh, which takes a look and helps our LGBTQ plus youth uh, in particular, amongst other things as well. So how many Love Good boxes are there now here in Edmonton? Um, as of Monday, there will be 11. And they're all over the city, like, and you know, it's really funny because for as much as, and I know, I know there are so many issues between the police and the, and the gay community, I, and the, well, LGBTQ community, I know that, right? And, but at the same time, we partnered with the NET team, and so our boxes, we know are safe there. And you know what, we have found that they are placed in in most part in such a way that people do not feel so uncomfortable going to a police station to get food right mm -hmm. um but it's because they can be watched for things like vandalism and you know just things that you know and they can be they they can make sure that they, they agree to be guardians so that they can make sure of, of that you know they're they're not in a situation where they're getting you know spoiled food that somebody's put in there or whatever and so Five of those boxes um, are now at, well, let me see. Right now there's one, two, three, four, four of those boxes, sorry, are at a fifth one on the way, are, um, will be placed um, at the police stations. Uh, we do have some community boxes because we know that people are not always comfortable going there. 
Um, there's one in Paul Kane Park. There is one uh, in Jasper Place. There's one in Delton. There's one in, I think it's Kilkenny or Killarney, but it's right next to Londonderry. Uh, there's one up there. There's about to be one in Clareview. You know, there, and there's one in Mill Woods. So are these boxes then easily identifiable that when someone looks at it, they know it's a love good box? All but one and one is becoming more identifiable really fast. We had to wait for the winter to go and we had to get, you know, deal with some things, you know, cause it is a recycle. The one in Paul Kane Park was just a recycling box until this weekend. Um, and now it is, it's been painted red. All the Love Good box are painted, are, you know, Love Good sort of drag family colors are red and black and clear, but you know, <laughs> plexiglass crowns is clear, right? <laughs> but they're all, you know, they all will be painted red. They all have their own names. Uh, those names are, are being painted on the boxes now. Um, and they all have their own little weird personalities <laughs> in their own inanimate way, but they all say love good on them at some point, um, except the Paul Kane one, which will have that soon. Actually, I might even do that tomorrow afternoon. We're not sure. Depends on whether I have black paint or not. <laughs> that's, f that's phenomenal. And I love the fact that they each have its own personality because considering it's coming from a drag family and love good family eccentric, amazing, great, eccentric. Um, and I love that they all have its own uh, different personalities. That's, that's absolutely brilliant. Have you been able to meet anybody or have you heard that feedback from anybody who's had, who has used the Love Good box for their own needs? You know, it's almost a regular occurrence, to be honest, because if you're over there, like, you know, they're sat, well, they're sanitized a couple of times a day, you know, because COVID and various other things like, you know, um, so they're sanitized a couple of times a day and unless it's minus 50 when it would just freeze, <laughs> but you know, now the weather's better. Um, and they're checked, they're checked really often. Like there are some that are obviously right outside EPS station or right outside somebody's residence so they can keep an eye on it. So they're checked very often and we do run into people on a regular basis. Um, so we've heard that, you know, I just heard the other day that there was this young couple coming down the street with their dog, you know, and they, they looked at me and said, you know, thank you for this box. And, you know, I don't advertise that I'm the one taking care of it often, you know, I mean, they see me over there enough. So I think people know, but I'm not a person who says, yeah, I'm the one taking care of this box at the box. Right. And they just come by and they, and I was painting it and, and they just said, you know, thank you for this. We would have starved to death if it hadn't been for this. You know, they both lost their jobs. They're trying to, you know, make ends meet. They've got rent to pay, you know, all hell is breaking loose. And then, you know, with curb and the tax situation, I think that's only going to get worse. Cause I know I owe this year for the first time in my life because I took curb. Um, so there's those kinds of situations. There are situations where I've had seniors come in and say, and the seniors crack me up. They're, they're my favorite people to talk to over there because they come up and they'll look in and they'll go, where's the chicken noodle soup? <laughs> but, you know, seniors often, I mean, seniors in Alberta on pension, if you're on basic pension, that is not a lot of money. Like, you know, and there's not, there's nothing left to eat off of for a lot of people. And I've heard those stories. So I hear, I hear the sad stories, but I also hear, the hope like and it's become kind of a community hub too like people put their cat lost cat poster there once in a while or you know or you know and they'll in the winter like when it was really cold there they just dumped clothing into that box that you know then i would collect it take it to chew or sometimes if it was like later at night i would leave it there because i know there's people sleeping in the street or if chew can't use those particular clothes because they don't have any clients of that size you know but they were just and then people were just started dropping off clothes at you when there was too much because we had to put a sign up that, you know, and this kind of thing happened. And it's all that community spirit that went on, you know, um, and that's what it's about. Like it, it wasn't about whether I started a box or the love goods started a box or who started it or who did it. And you know, it wasn't even about that. It was about that a whole, I, I mean, I really know about Oliver cause I live here. Right. 
it was about that whole neighborhood just came together. It became this little sort of meeting hub. Like there are people that go over there just to see what the box is going, what's going on at the box today. You know, it's like the water cooler. <laughs> and I had, well, these three seniors, I got to tell you about the three seniors. Cause I know you're going to ask anyway. Yes, please. We have these three seniors that call themselves the golden girls. <laughs> and there, two of them were actually named Dorothy and Rose. And one of them was named Annabelle, but she was a spinning image of Sophia Petrillo. Mm -hmm. Right down to the little perm and the big purse and the short, yeah. And they would sit on the bench all day long in these polyester suits, right? You know, the ones. Yeah. And they would sit on the bench and watch this box. So I called them the senior security system <laughs> all summer long. They'd be there, it, it, you know, but they had specific times because, you know, there's nap and, you know, they had to watch the wheel. Like there was that, right? <laughs> but, and they would watch this box. And then I'd get these reports and they would be, you know, I just love them because I get the security report of the day kind of thing from them. That Gus was by again. And I figure that Gus must live there, you know, like in their same, because they all lived in the Kinsman, hey? Yeah, that Gus was there and he took three cans of chicken noodle soup. Now he lives by himself. He doesn't need three cans of chicken noodle soup. <laughs> you know? But they would come by and, and put things in, you know, or they would tell me if they thought there was a problem or, or they'd say things like, well, you know, and they were out there and they're like, well, we asked Gus to sweep this up because there was too much gravel here, but Gus, I see didn't do it. So somebody else is going to have to do it, you know? But they were funny and they were so great. And they would tell me little stories about their life. Like, you know, Dorothy was gardening during the war and feeding people and during the depression too. Her mother did it during the depression and she did it during the war. And she just kept that up her whole life, just feeding people that needed it. So, you know, and Sophia had, well, Annabelle, Sophia. Yeah, I like <laughs> Sophia, just, yeah. Yeah, what the hell? She had these binoculars that she'd pull out of her purse, and you'd see her trying to sneak these binoculars out, but then it was so obvious, and then she'd be there looking at the box, you know? And then they'd elbow each other when something good went in there. Oh, that is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, I'm, I'm, I, as you're talking there, it's part of why I wanted to do this podcast is because you know, I'm inside all day, 24 seven now, whereas before I was out and about and I miss the stories. I miss the interaction with people. And, you know, and I, I said it now, this is maybe the eighth interview I've done and, uh, you know, out of order when it goes out there. But every single time I'm like, at the end, I'm like, I think I've just met my newest favorite person. I said that to George hey, and Claire is always up there and Robert and Ron and all that. And I am absolutely thrilled to have been able to spend this last hour with you. You know, I, as I mentioned before, Quinn, I, I've seen you from afar and wanted to ask questions because, you know, I'm interested, of course, but just fantastic. Uh, Quinn, is there a website or is there a Facebook group? where people can follow what's happening with the love good or how what's the best way that we can get more information about the love good project in the boxes you can email lovegoodfoodbox at gmail.com um if you want uh to be a guardian in your area and want some information on how to do that we are doing a fan out with the net team um with a, a pamphlets that they're being printed. Actually, the provincial maps department is helping, is printing them for us, designing and printing them. Yeah, so we're doing a fan out with some information. Uh, the YEG COVID-19 group is a wonderful place to be. Uh, we partnered also with the John Humphrey. I'm getting it all in here. Aren't yeah, I'm don't saying? tell it to John us. John Humphrey's Center uh, for Peace and Human Rights. And, you know, Renee over there has been phenomenal. Uh, we have links with the food bank through them, you know, that, that helps stock the boxes. Um, so, but it, they also run the YEG COVID-19 group. Um, and it is a support group. Uh, the Love Good Food Box updates go in there. You can go right to my page, that my Harry Schnitt, there, there's actually a Facebook page, my Harry Schnitt, Prince Harry Schnitzel uh, page, if you just search that. There are always updates on what's going on there and also what's going on with the court, what's going on in other places are on there. Um, it's 
you can find it in a lot of places. Um, if you are in need of food, clothing, et cetera, et cetera, that, that YEG COVID-19 group is a great place to go. Also, if you have stuff to offer to people, like, you know, who may need it, like there's everything in there, you know, people are, and, and they don't deal in money. That's the only thing, like it has to be a product, right? If you're hungry and you can't get through till tomorrow, you can ask for food hampers. There are all kinds of free meals that businesses are giving away and stuff like that listed there. So it's not just the boxes, it's all kinds of, of you know, things like new pe people who've just moved or left abusive situations who need furniture, for example, or somebody has furniture to offer to somebody who needs it, or somebody got too much craft dinner <laughs> last month and they have a whole crate because there was a case sale, you know, and it, it's, it's also a good place to go just because there's, you can see the heart of Edmonton there. You really can see it. You know, somebody says, I'm out of this, please help. I don't have baby formula. And all of a sudden five people go, oh, I have baby formula. And they say, well, I can't pick it up. And they'll go, we can drop it off. It's that cool. Wow. Just absolutely amazing. I mean, we've talked a lot about a lot of, about a lot of different subjects here today and I'm very thankful you've uh, opened up my eyes to a lot of things that I didn't know about before so um, I always thought I knew some things but there's a lot of things I need to know and thank you for that it's been a fun thing it really has well on behalf of Quinn or Harry Schnitzel um, I want to thank everyone for listening to this Tales of the LGBTQ plus episode today just telling everyone to be good and always text when you get home. Until next time.